Welcome to Tanakh Talk. I'm your host, William Hall, broadcasting live from Kingston, Texas, USA, with another episode of a rabbi cross-examines the New Testament with Rabbi Michael Skoback. This week we're on 2 Timothy chapter 3. Welcome back, Rabbi. How are you, sir? Shalom, William. Great to be back with you. Thank you. Shalom, shalom to have you back as well. Very, very awesome. So we're strolling right on along. One one <laughs> one chapter at a time. We're getting there. <laughs> so slow but steady wins the race. Yes, yes. Hey, real quickly before we get going on this, if you don't mind, tell us a little bit about how uh, your launching of Torah Paths uh, is going. We'd like to hear something about that. So thank God it's going nicely. Um, you know, our website's getting uh, a lot of uh, visitors, a lot of views, and uh, we've had about nine hundred people. Uh, asked for our free ebook, and uh, it's still available. Wow. Anyone still wants it? Nice. Uh, they can grab it. And as you saw, there was someone that has a uh, YouTube channel that did a little nice coverage of. Tanakh yes, Talk. yes. <laughs> I reached out to that guy, and I haven't had time to follow through with that yet. But I'm going to. I'm going. Yeah, to I that. said hello to him as well, Good. and uh, that was nice. And uh, you know, the, the, the number of students. Are growing and uh, you know growing slowly and uh, as, as we offer more programs uh, you know the, the participation will grow and uh, I'm hoping it will be a vehicle to help people uh, study Torah and to learn Torah in a, in a serious way um, and what's nice is we have students from all across the world and you know it, it's such a blessing that we can do that in the, in the 21st century that was not possible right. you know 15 years ago um, so thank God. Thank you for asking. Sure. And, uh, yeah. Well, Baruch Hashem, that's good to hear. 900. Oh, that's, 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 that's nice. <laughs> well, a lot, lot, lot of curious people out there. That's good. It's free. I'm surprised yeah. there aren't 9,000 people who oh, asked yeah, for right, it. Right. As the word begin, <laughs> as the word spreads, that's good, definitely going to reach that pretty quickly. I'm sure. Okay. No so, problem. Okay. Robert, while I hand this off to you, we'll, uh, get this, get this baby going. Second Timothy chapter three. Here we go. Right, so uh, it's been a while since we uh, did a program together, and uh, I think that what I asked for this uh, chapter to be titled um, is going to be is the New Testament scripture, and we'll we'll really get a chance to think about that. Um, obviously, uh, the church has insisted that the New Testament, the Greek writings they insist are part of the Bible. And so that'll be, uh, I guess, a major focus of this week's chapter. So Paul begins in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3 in verse 1 by speaking about difficult times, he said, he says that will come before the last days. Difficult times before the last days will come, he says, making some kind of prediction. And we actually have such an idea in Torah literature, we find in the Talmud, for example, the concept of Hevle Mashiach, the birth pangs of the Messiah. You know, when a woman's in labor, she has labor pains. And so the messianic process in, in Talmud, there is the, at least the possibility, not every woman has labor pains. Some women, you know, they'll talk about you know, taking a taxi to the hospital and the baby pops out and there was no labor pains. So um, but normally there are labor pains and the, the sages in the Talmud speak about the possibility at least of difficult times before the messianic process comes to fruition. And, um, it's important to realize that, uh, it doesn't have to happen. You know, Paul here is making a definitive statement. He's saying difficult times will come. And in the Torah, we don't have such an idea that negative prophecies, negative ideas have to take place. Um, all negative prophecies are contingent. They're all uh, conditional, depending. Um, you know, the, the, the source for this in the Bible is or at least one of the sources is the book of Jonah, where God sends the prophet Jonah to Nineveh and warns them that in 50 day, in 40 days, Nineveh will be overturned. Nineveh will be overturned. And um, 
you know, he was afraid of giving this prophecy, Yonah. He was afraid that they would repent and then God would not destroy them and he would look like a false prophet. And that was one reason why he was he was concerned. The other reason he was concerned was that he knew that Israel was not responding so uh, readily to the warnings of the prophets. And here, if the city of Nineveh would respond, you know, and repent right away, that would make Israel look bad. And so we know that's why Yonah wanted to run away and not even go to give this prophecy. But, you know, you can run, but you can't hide. And he, he's not able to get away. And God makes sure that, you know, by hook or by crook, Yonah is going to end up in Nineveh. And uh, what he didn't understand is that the nature of what he said can cut two ways. Meaning that he says in Hebrew, Nineveh nehefeches, it will be overturned. So he assumed that what it meant was that in 40 days, this city is going to look like Sodom and Amorah. Right. It's going to be all the buildings will collapse and it's going to be destroyed. But we understand that the term to be overturned can be understood spiritually, meaning that the city can turn itself over. And it's possible that the people will respond to Yonah's prophecy and warnings by repenting, which we see is exactly what they did in the book of Jonah. And so the prophecy does come true either way, meaning either they will turn themselves over, the city will be overturned because they'll turn themselves over, they'll repent, they'll turn away from their evil uh, deeds and they'll turn back to God. Or if they don't and they resist uh, Jonah, Jonah's warning, then the city will be overturned, it will be destroyed. And so what we see in this story is that every negative prophecy doesn't have to come about in a negative way. And so um, we have this idea of Hevle Mashiach, the birth pangs of the Messiah, but it doesn't have to happen. The Talmud in Tractate Sanhedrin 98a says that the Mashiach, Messiah, will come either to a generation that is totally righteous or totally wicked. Now, how does that work? So if people begin to understand that we have a responsibility and a need to get our act together and to begin to uh, take stock of our lives, both as individuals and as a generation, and to improve. So we will, as a generation, begin to work on ourselves and improve until the generation is righteous and the redemption will come. You know, that's how God describes, for example, in Deuteronomy chapter 30, God speaks about uh, the nation of Israel turning to God, a national repentance, a national revival. And then God says he will send the redemption. He will gather the exiles. So either the messianic redemption will come to a generation that's totally righteous or totally wicked. Now, the Talmud explains that we have a principle that in order for the messianic process to, to, to happen, Israel has to repent. Repentance has to precede the coming of the Messiah. So there's two possibilities. Either we will have repented and turned to God as a movement of national repentance and revival on our own, because we understand that's what we should be doing, or Israel will not get the message. And then what the Bible says and the Talmud says is that God is going to send suffering and persecution to Israel that will basically force us to repent, meaning that, you know, there's, they, they say there's no atheist in a foxhole. And in the same way that when Israel is pushed up against the wall and we recognize that there's no hope otherwise, we can't help ourselves, we're about to be wiped out it's going to force us to turn to God. And so that's what the sages are saying, that in a generation that's totally wicked, what's going to happen is God is going to use that opportunity of a totally wicked nation to bring upon them persecution and suffering, and that will force them to repent, and then the redemption will come. So 
there's two scenarios. And at the end, they really boil down to one scenario, meaning either we uh, achieve righteousness and repentance on our own without having been forced into it, so to speak, or God makes repentance something which we have no alternative but to choose it because he's turned up the heat. And so what you see here is that there doesn't have to be suffering, meaning that if we turn to God and we engage in a process of national revival, God does not need to push us in that direction by turning up the heat. And so those negative prophecies that we refer to as Hevle Mashiach, the birth pangs of the Messiah, Jeremiah, for example, speaks about, you know, the, the, the days of suffering, the, you know, the dark days for Israel, doesn't have to happen. That is only going to happen if we don't wake up and smell the coffee burning on our own. And so, um, you know, this is an important distinction, I think, in that Paul seems to say that the suffering and difficult times is inevitable. And in the Torah, we believe that no, uh, negative prophecies are not inevitable. Now, what's interesting is that Paul, it's very strange here. Paul says that these difficult times will come before the last days. It seems that he's speaking about the future. You know, he's, he's writing here in second Timothy and he seems to be speaking about what's going to happen down the road. But if you look at what is written in the book of Acts, chapter two, verse 17, it seems that they believed already um, at that time in the beginning of the book of Acts, which is basically a Pentecost, um, that they believed that they were already in the last days. They believed that it was already going on. So it's not really, this may be a, a contradiction between uh, Paul and the writer of Acts. Um, in any event, what happens in verses two through seven is that Paul describes how society will become increasingly corrupt um, at that time. And he lists various vices and immoralities and moral and spiritual decay that will typify and, and really be the nature of the day um, in those end times. And it's interesting because when you study the Talmud and the Talmud speaks about uh, the, uh, the the corruption of society before the coming of the Messiah, it's very, very similar. You know, it speaks about authority being questioned and truth being something that's in rare, uh, you know, becomes a rare commodity. And there's a lack of respect for elders and for teachers. Um, the Talmud says, for example, that arrogance and chutzpah will be on the increase people will be brazen. So it, it's very similar. I mean, it's one of these places where Paul's description, Paul may have actually had these teachings of Judaism in mind because they're very similar. The way Paul describes the corruption of society is very similar to the way, again, the Talmud, uh, for example, at the end of Tractate Sota, they have a whole list of things that will characterize the generation before the coming of Messiah. Um, now, in this sort of rant that you find in verse five, um, John MacArthur gets in another one of his nasty anti-Semitic digs. Um, he says the following in, in describing people who, uh, in, in, the, in the words of Paul, Paul says people having a form of godliness, but denying its power. Paul speaks about people during this uh, you know, this, this ugly time as people having a form of godliness, but denying its power. And John MacArthur in his commentary writes, like the unbelieving scribes and Pharisees concerned more with mere external appearances. And this is a, a unfortunately a uh, ancient canard that we hear from Christian writers that Jewish people are not spiritual we're very superficial. All we care about are externalities and how we look and, you know, the, just putting on a good show and it's all form and no content. This is a, a, you know, it goes throughout the gospels, the same 
uh, you know, critique of the Pharisees and and MacArthur continues it here in his commentary to Second Timothy. Um, but it, it's a it's a kind of statement that is ignorant, um, that's absurd, and it's an ugly generalization, meaning that if you were to take any uh, religious group in the world, of course, you'll find among its practitioners, some people who are superficial, some people who are just into looking spiritual or acting spiritual or trying to seem spiritual or what have you. Um, but that applies to any religious and spiritual group in the world. I'm sure that any churchgoer would, if they're honest, say, yeah, there are people in my church like that. And so to speak about the Pharisees and scribes as a group, really generalizing about them as an entire group, that they're only concerned with mere external appearances is disgusting and it's ugly and it's ignorant because it shows that someone like John MacArthur knows absolutely nothing about the Pharisees. All he seems to know is the ugly uh, you know, criticisms and slander of the Pharisees that he reads in the Christian Bible. You know, it's no coincidence, by the way, that if you get any dictionary, almost any dictionary, you know, uh, any big dictionary in the world today, you look up the word Pharisee, the dictionary definition of Pharisee is religious hypocrite. Now, that's disgusting. That's that's ugly. And you know where it's coming from. It, it's not coming from someone who has d done any research into who the Pharisees really were. It's just someone that's read the Christian Bible's slander of the Pharisees and attacks on them. Um, for example, I wonder what John MacArthur would say about the um, people described in the Talmud and Tractate Brachot, the first tractate of the Talmud, the people who would meditate for an hour before praying every day, they would pray for an hour and they would meditate for an hour after they prayed in order to come down. Now, these are not people that are superficial. These are not people that are trying to put on a show. These are people whose prayer life was so deep that they wanted to prepare for their prayer. They wanted to get themselves ready to have this intimate moment with God. And so they would literally meditate for an hour and then they would pray for an hour and then they would come down for an hour. These are people um, who, pe who John MacArthur, you know, can't even touch their shoelaces on a spiritual level. And so anyone that would actually bother studying the Talmud, studying the writings of the sages of the Talmud, uh, would realize that these kind of ugly slanders are just baseless. And it's interesting that there have been Christians who've done that. There are Christians who have made it their um, point to actually go through the Talmud and see for themselves who these Pharisees were. And they sing a very, very different tune than people who make these uh, ugly swipes without ever having bothered to look close at the people they're criticizing. Um, so it's unfortunate to see because John MacArthur is considered to be one of the foremost evangelical uh, Protestant you know, scholars or commentaries to the Bible that exists today. Um, and yet he's not beyond saying something so, uh, you know, absurd and disgusting. Um, in verse eight, Paul mentions two characters. Uh, I don't know how to pronounce them in Greek or however this is supposed to be pronounced, but it's written in English, I guess, in most translations as Janus and Jambres. Um, and he, he just speaks about these two characters um, as people that opposed Moses. Now, what's obvious to any student of the Bible is that you won't find these two people mentioned anywhere in the Bible. So what is Paul speaking about here, these two people that opposed Moses? Um, what you will find, for example, 
in the Targum Yonasan, there is a translation, which is really a translation and a commentary to the five books of Moses um, into Aramaic. There are several, um, there's a Targum Unculus and the Targum Yonatan. By the way, I described these translations in my book, A Guide to Torah Literature. And uh, so the Targum Yonatan is an ancient um, commentary translation of the Torah into Aramaic. And in its translation of Numbers, chapter 22, verse 22, it tells oh, us the that these two Aramaic. characters, Janus and Jambres, were sons of Bilam, Bilam the uh, magician and, and wicked prophet who was hired to curse Israel. So these two characters were sons of Bilam, and the the Targum tells us that they were actually magicians themselves who served in the court of Pharaoh uh, when Moses was, was dealing with this Pharaoh. And they actually later left Egypt as part of the mixed multitude, part of the Erev Rav, and that they were part of the group that instigated uh, and egged on the building of the golden calf. So there is in Midrashic literature and rabbinic literature, we see these two characters mentioned and discussed. But where does Paul get this information from? And this is obviously a serious problem for Christians that jump up and down saying sola scriptura, sola scriptura. All we really believe in is what it says in the text of the Bible. Anything that's not in the text of the Bible, as far as they're concerned, is not worth its weight in salt. So here you see the Christian Bible, you know, certainly not engaging in the policy of sola scriptura. Uh, Paul here is banking on and, and withdrawing deposits from the rabbinic literature, from this rabbinic translation into Aramaic and from other midrashim that are rabbinic, but this is nowhere, these characters are nowhere mentioned in the text of scripture. Um, then Paul says something which, again, it seems, you know, just to be simply an inaccurate statement. Paul says in verse 12, all those who desire to live godly lives and follow Jesus will be persecuted. Now, that's an absolute statement. All those who desire to live godly lives following Jesus will be persecuted. Now, it's not clear if he means for the time that he's writing, when Paul was writing, like, you know, when Paul's writing, he's saying anyone during my time that tries to follow Jesus will be persecuted, or is he making this statement for all time, meaning that th this is for, I guess, what he's describing in this chapter as the last days, which again, begin before Paul is writing and they're gonna go up until uh, the return of Jesus as far as Christians are concerned. So this obviously is a false statement because it, it's, it's, at, at best, it's an incredible exaggeration because we know that not everyone who seeks to live the godly lives and follow Jesus is persecuted. You know, there, there are not many Christians in the United States that are being persecuted for their faith in Jesus. Um, and, you know, while there have been certainly some Christians in the world who have been persecuted for their faith, it's just absurd to say that it describes every single Christian who seeks to live a godly life. Um, now, in verse 15, um, I want to just share a comment by David Stern. David Stern uh, is a Hebrew Christian, a Messianic Jew living in Israel from the United States originally. And he wrote a, uh, well, he has a translation of the uh, Christian Bible and he has a commentary to it. And he writes, and he actually, I think he says this several times. He says, the Holy Scriptures can give the wisdom that leads to deliverance through trusting in Jesus. Um, you know, this chapter here, it speaks about Timothy as someone who was raised by two women, his mother and grandmother, who exposed him to the scriptures. 
and you know many commentaries seem to assume that it was his knowledge of scripture that led him to accept Jesus as the Messiah. And that's what David Stern says here. He says the Holy Scriptures, meaning the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible, can give the wisdom that leads to deliverance through trusting in Jesus. Now, um, I think a few weeks ago, after we did our last show, someone posted to, um, I don't know if it was the uh, exit, um, the, um, the Tanakh talk, uh, Facebook group or some other Facebook group I was on, but someone paste, someone posted a video of a an academic actually. I think he he's an academic from Israel who is a believer in Jesus, hmm. and uh, he he basically he shared his testimony, and uh, the bottom line of what he was saying was that. Um, You know, he read the Tanakh and it was clear to him through reading the Tanakh that he he has to believe in Jesus. And what I found fascinating is, and this is something that I've seen literally hundreds of times from the testimony of Jewish people who give this impression that, you know, all of a sudden they picked up a Tanakh. And they started reading it and they gave their life to Jesus. And he, they give the impression, and that's what this professor, uh, I think he's a professor uh, or a teacher at least, gives the impression that, you know, that for him and for these people, the Tanakh is such an important book, such an, an incredibly important book that they treasure and they value and they believe in that as soon as they saw that they believed it pointed to Jesus, they had to make a life-changing decision that ultimately alienated them from their families and to become Christians. That's the impression they give, that, that, you know, this is a book that changed their lives. But the fallacy of all of these testimonies is that these are people who the day before they came to faith in Jesus They were not following anything in the Tanakh. They were people who may not have studied the Tanakh carefully, but they were aware of the fact that there are dietary laws, that there is laws about observing the Sabbath, that there are laws about who you're allowed to have sex with, that there are laws about putting on phylacteries. They, especially someone growing up in Israel like this fellow, um, you know, if it was really true that this person believed that the Tanakh was the word of God and they took it seriously, then why weren't they following anything in it at all until they up- opened it up and read verses that probably were shown to them by Christians that convinced them that the Tanakh is speaking about Jesus? There's, now, there's a guy all named, of a sudden... There's a guy named Matteo Balliston. You probably have heard his name. Sure. Right, and sure. He was, he's he's another. He's American, though. He's a, he's, he's American. well. He's an example of that false advertising, though. Projects himself as raised in a strictly strictly orthodox home, you know, heavily studied, but he wasn't. It was very much a secular a secular Jew. Uh, but they use that to try to convince more people. That, hey, I'm a I'm a real Jew, and I see, and I still see Jesus in the new, in the Hebrew scriptures. So it's right. just false advertising. But the, but the point I'm trying to make is that. You know, if someone was really secular and they didn't take the Bible seriously, then who cares if Isaiah sounds like it's talking about Jesus? That's what I'm saying, that these are people that that was their attitude about observing the Sabbath or observing the dietary right, laws. Right. They knew that it was in the Bible, but their attitude was, who cares? I don't take the Bible seriously. Right. I don't believe it's the word of God. So I'm not going to follow what the Bible teaches. And so when they now claim that all of a sudden, you know, they were shown passages in the Bible that sound like Jesus and now they're becoming a Christian, why did this happen? Meaning that it it doesn't seem like prior to this, they did take the Bible very seriously. Um, So these testimonies all, I mean, almost all of them have this peculiarity in common.
But that's not what I wanted to focus on for today. Um, the, the key verse in this chapter, this is one of the most famous verses from Paul, is the verse uh, 16 in this chapter, um, that all scripture is inspired by God. All scripture is inspired by God. And the question is, what is this referring to? When Paul says here, all scripture is inspired by God. So it seems from the context, um, and I think quite a few Christian commentaries agree to this, that when Paul writes here in, um, you know, in this chapter that all scripture is inspired by God, he's referring to the Tanakh, because at this point there was no New Testament, didn't exist. So the context seems to be that it's referring to the Hebrew scriptures, and that he's saying that all of scripture is, um, you know, inspired by God. Um, now, you have some Christian commentaries, for example, John MacArthur, uh, in his commentary here, insists that no, this is referring to the New Testament as well. Now, I don't know if he would say that Paul himself meant the New Testament. That doesn't make sense. There was no New Testament. But I think that what he would say is that by implication, since Paul is saying that all scripture is divinely inspired, um, and Christians believe that the New Testament is scripture, then the New Testament becomes divinely inspired. Um, but, you know, that's the problem we're going to have to look at now. You know, would it make sense to include the Greek scriptures in this verse? The verse says that all scripture is inspired by God, um, but that's going to be our question now for the next few minutes. Um, does it make any sense to include the Christian Bible in this kind of verse? So I've said this before, but I think that one of the most clever and one of the most powerful things that Christianity ever did was to glue the Greek Testament onto the back of the Tanakh. That was a brilliant piece of marketing because it gives the impression in a very visible way, in a very visual way, that the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, and Romans, etc., they're part of the Bible. You can see it. <laughs> There's the Bible. There's Genesis through Deuteronomy and the prophets and the writings, and then you have the, the Greek scriptures, and they're all in one book together. So sort of by, you know, simply just gluing those scriptures onto the back of the Hebrew Bible, they made a very, very powerful statement. And f for most people that don't think too clearly, you know, this is a slam dunk. It sort of makes the case and, you know, people don't think any further. Um, and it's interesting, by the way, that Mormons did the same thing. I have in my library what Mormons call a triple Bible. It's quite thick. I mean, you can't stick it in your back pocket. It's the, it's the Tanakh, it's the Hebrew scriptures, it's the Greek scriptures, it's the New Testament, and then it has all the Mormon scriptures as the Book of Mormon and the Pearl of Great Price and, doc, and Doctrines and Covenants, etc. cetera. Um, so they did the same thing. You know, th they wanted to give the impression that the Mormon scriptures are also scripture. And the most powerful way of doing that is just simply attaching it to the rest of the Christian Bible. Um, so it's interesting that Paul wrote himself in Romans chapter three, verse two, Paul wrote that God entrusted the scriptures to the Jews. Paul himself says that, that the scriptures, the oracles of God were entrusted to the Jewish people. The problem is that Christians tampered with those oracles, with those scriptures in a number of ways. For example, Christians switched the order of the books. Now, that doesn't seem like to be a, a capital crime, but who gives them the right to switch the order of the books that the Jews had determined? That's something that the Jews didn't decide to order the books of the Tanakh in the way that the 
Christian Bible later reordered them, dis distorted them. And then, of course, the, 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 the real crime, so to speak, religiously, is that the Christian Bible added to the Tanakh. What gives them the right to do that? How do they have the right to take the Bible that was entrusted to the Jewish people and to say, well, we have, you know, we have more books to add. You know, where do you see in the Tanakh where the Tanakh ends by saying, but wait, there's more or to be continued. So the problem is, and this is a problem for the church, that once they feel comfortable doing that, once they feel comfortable taking the oracles of God, that no one disputes come from God. No one disputes that the Tanakh is divinely inspired. The question is, is anything that comes afterward divinely inspired? So once the church has the uh, audacity to add to those scriptures that were entrusted to the people of Israel, what's to stop then someone else from adding on to the Christian Bible? which is exactly what happened to the Christians when the Mormons added the Mormon scriptures. So they're playing a very dangerous game. So again, Paul says that God entrusted the scriptures to the Jewish people, but Christians tampered with those scriptures by mixing around the order, by switching around the order of the books in the Tanakh, and then by adding uh, the Greek scriptures on to the Tanakh. So when it says here that all scripture is inspired by God, it's clear that, you know, on the simplest level, this is referring to only the Tanakh, only the Hebrew Bible, because that's all that existed when Paul wrote this. Um, there was no New Testament at the time. And the context, if you, we're not going to dive into this now, but if you study the context of verse 16, going back to verse 15, it's pretty clear that the context is talking about the Hebrew Bible, because it's talking about what uh, Timothy had growing up that laid the foundation for him to come to faith in Jesus. Now, what's important to think about, and that's going to be what I'd like to talk about for the next few minutes, is what makes something scripture? How do you know that something is scripture? Who says that something is scripture? Who determines what should be included in scripture? And who gave these people the authority to make such decisions? And we've discussed this in the past. I'm not going to elaborate on it. But basically, um, it's, it, it's a simple progression. Um, we'll take the five books of Moses. Um, we know with crystal clear clarity why those books are divinely inspired and why they belong in the Bible. Because the experience of the nation of Israel at Mount Sinai was that they all heard God speaking to Moses. It was not Moses convincing people that he was a prophet. He didn't have to make the case that God spoke to him. Everyone heard God spoke to him. That's Exodus chapter 19, verse 9. And many other passages, if you read Deuteronomy chapter 4 and 5, the Bible is constantly emphasizing that everyone heard God speak at Mount Sinai. It was not something that Moses had to convince anyone of. So the authority and the, the source of Moses' prophecy is established without any doubt. Uh, everyone that was around heard God speak to Moses. The $64,000 question is regarding all the other books in the Tanakh. How do we know that Joshua is a prophet? How do we know that Samuel is a prophet? And how do we know that Isaiah is a prophet? And how do we know Jeremiah is a prophet? How do we know that Ovadja is a prophet, etc.? And so the simplest way to figure out whether they're prophets is if God would do the same act with them, meaning if God would have spoken to Isaiah in the, you know, so that all of Israel could hear when he spoke to Isaiah, that would clear things up and there'd be no question. But that's not what God did. And what God told us in the book of Deuteronomy is that prophecy is something that has to be judged because it's a capital 
crime to be a false prophet. And so if a person's a false prophet, theoretically, they can be executed, could be a death sentence. So the question is, who determines whether someone is a true prophet or a false prophet? Who makes that determination? And it's clearly not the person that's claiming to be a true prophet, meaning that every false prophet is going to claim to be a true prophet. And so what God says, this is not something the rabbis made up. God says in Deuteronomy chapter 17 that capital cases are decided by the judges and the sages who will be living in each generation, meaning the leading Jewish sages and judges and authorities, the leading Torah scholars will be the ones to determine whether someone is a true prophet or not. Now, after our last show, someone was very bothered when I said this and they said, no, they said, if you go to Deuteronomy 18, it tells you that a true prophet can be determined because he'll do miracles. And if, uh, and if a person gives a sign or a wonder, that's how you know they're a true prophet. False. That's not the case. Because in Deuteronomy chapter 13, we're told very clearly, God says, I'm going to send you people who will be able to do signs and wonders and miracles. God's telling us there are going to be such people who can do miracles and do signs. And God is saying, but don't listen to them. They're false prophets. And I've only sent them to you to be testing you, to be as a test. So the fact that someone can do miracles is not a proof positive that they are a true legitimate prophet. It's just that for a person's claim to prophecy to even get off the ground, they have to at least do a sign and a wonder. They have to be able to predict the future. But that doesn't mean that they're necessarily a true prophet. That means that we have to take them seriously. But then the court has to determine whether they are a true prophet or not. And one of the main ways that the court can determine whether they are a false prophet is if they teach Israel to follow another God or they teach Israel not to observe the commandments of the Torah, then you know without a doubt that they're false prophets. So what we're going to do is just spend a few moments going through some of the reasons. Again, this would be a two or three hour discussion. Some of the reasons why, uh, when we look at the writers of the Christian scriptures, they're not considered to be part of the Tanakh. Simple reason, because they contradict the Tanakh. The, the teachings of the Christian Bible basically are not in line. They don't line up with the Tanakh. And this is not just, you know, Rabbi Skobach, who is going to hell, that realized this. What's amazing is that a growing number of people in the church are realizing this on their own and they don't have rabbis knocking on their door and giving them tracts to convince them of this. You have a growing number of people who've grown up in the church and they themselves are realizing, wait a second, this doesn't add up. The, the teachings of the New Testament don't line up with the teachings of the Tanakh. And so it's not, again, just something which some, you know, miserable, you know, <laughs> Pharisee rabbi has who's opposed to Christianity. This is something which uh, many people who are totally objective without a Jewish bias are able to see on their own. So I'll just go through quickly some of the, an outline of some of the problems. Number one, is all of the Torah commandments, are all of the Torah commandments eternally binding? Let's say at least for the people of Israel meaning that the Jews have to observe all of the commandments of the Torah, meaning the ritual and the ceremonial commandments. So they have to get circumcised and they have to keep kosher and keep the Sabbath, etc. So they have to check their clothing to make sure there's no wool and linen mixed together. So in the Tanakh, it's very clear that the commandments of God must be observed forever, eternally throughout your generations. It seems pretty clear from the Christian Bible, at least the way it's understood by the vast majority of Christians for the past 2000 years is that no, only the civil laws have to be observed forever, but the ceremonial laws, the ritual laws are no longer binding. You'll find many Christians today who say uh, a person could observe them if they want to, but they're not under obligation to do it. Um, and certainly it's not going to help in their salvation. Um, secondly, 
what is the evaluation of the commandments of the Torah? So anyone that just goes through everything that's said about the law in the Christian Bible, it doesn't paint a rosy picture. Uh, Paul writes about the law as the curse of the law. He says they're just a, a ministry of death engraved on stone. He says they're testimonies that are worthless. They're useless. Useless. He calls them but dung. I mean, he, he has a whole litany of expressions where he does not uh, jump up and down explaining how incredible and wonderful God's commandments are. But if you go through the Tanakh, every time the Tanakh writes about the commandments, look at chapter 19 in Psalms, look at chapter 119 in Psalms, the longest chapter in the Bible. All it speaks about is how wonderful and delicious and beautiful and precious the God, God's commandments are. Another issue is who is God? Um, and is the Messiah supposed to be God? So again, according to the way most Christians have understood the Christian Bible for the past 2,000 years, they understand that God will take on human form in the Trinity and that the Messiah will be divine, will be God. And in the Jewish scriptures, the Messiah is a human being. The prophets make that very clear. Isaiah chapter 11 says the Messiah will be someone who fears God. He doesn't say the Messiah will be God. And throughout the Hebrew scriptures, we see that God is uh, a unity that does not take on physical form. Uh, again, we don't have time to give all the proofs for this, but that's another major area of discrepancy. And then the definition of Messiah in the Hebrew scriptures, the definition of Messiah is clear. He'll be a descendant of David who will rule Israel as a literal political king at a time when the world will be uh, united as a place where every human being believes in God and all human beings are living in peace and the Jewish people are living at peace in their homeland and our temple's been rebuilt and we're worshiping in the temple and bringing sacrifices. That's not the definition of the Messiah according to the Christian Bible. Uh, they might say, may say, that some of that will apply at the second coming of the Messiah, but their definition of the Messiah is that the Messiah comes to die as a sacrifice to atone for the sins of the world. Two very, very different job descriptions of the Messiah. Another question is, how do we get forgiven for our sins? In the Hebrew scriptures, it's very clear. Uh, Jeremiah, uh, I'm sorry, Ezekiel uh, says very clearly, when the question is raised, how do we basically deal with our sins? The answer is repentance. You turn to God to repent. You turn away from your sins. Entire chapters of the Bible, Ezekiel chapter 18, for example, this is what it teaches, that you are forgiven for your sins. You deal with your sin by turning away from them and turning back to God. In Christianity, it's very clear. There's only one way of being forgiven for your sins, and that's through having a sacrifice of blood offered on your behalf. In the Jewish Bible, a blood sacrifice is not enough. Uh, to atone for sins. By itself, it doesn't do anything. The Bible says in Proverbs that the sacrifice of a wicked person is an abomination to God. So you can't simply bring a sacrifice and be forgiven. And then the question of what is the nature of man? In the Christian understanding, man is a flawed person, a flawed creature. The human being is basically under the control of Satan, according to the New Testament. And the human being is someone that cannot be righteous and cannot be seen as righteous by God, cannot be good. Uh, the only way a person can be seen as good is if they essentially become merged into the Messiah, who they believe is perfectly good. You can only become good on the coattails of Jesus. But in the Jewish scriptures, human beings have free will. We're not born sinners. God tells us that sin will always tempt us, but we can rule over it. And God says we have the choice to choose life and to choose uh, to follow God and not to choose sin. And that the Hebrew Bible makes it very clear that people can be righteous. It makes it very clear that even righteous people sometimes sin, but the nature of a righteous person is that they learn from their sins and they grow from their sins. So it says in Proverbs chapter 24, verse 16, that the righteous person will fall down seven times, but they'll get up. But that's how they become righteous, through falling down and getting up. Then another question, who has authority to decide issues of law? So 
in the Hebrew scriptures, it's very clear. It's the leading Torah sages of any generation. In the Christian formula, that was taken away from them. Uh, there was a a chain of, of tradition, a chain of transmission that went all the way back to Moses. And Paul acknowledges that in Romans chapter 3, when he says that the scriptures were entrusted to Israel. It was entrusted to us because we had an unbroken chain of tradition. We had a quality control lab that made sure that the Torah was preserved accurately and that we had people who were able to decide issues of doubt. And that authority was given by God to the leading Torah scholars. But the church basically co-opted that and said, no, it's going to be the leading church people, even if they're not Torah observant, even if they're not Jewish, they're now in the driver's seat. Another question, the land of Israel, throughout the Hebrew Bible, the land of Israel plays a critical role in everything. It's a land that God promised to the children of Israel forever, and it plays a critical role in the unfolding of the redemption. But in the Christian Bible, the land of Israel plays virtually no role for the followers of Jesus. They don't have to be living in the land of Israel. You could be a great Christian living in Wyoming or living in Prague. You don't have to be living in Israel. It's not critical. Whereas in the Jewish scriptures, the land of Israel is the only promised land. Another question, who is part of God's chosen people? So in the Hebrew Bible, God's people are the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob genealogically. In the Christian Bible, God's people is made up of anyone who believes in Jesus, whether they are from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, or they're not from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And one last thing I'll point out before we close for tonight is that the Christian scriptures are just riddled with factual problems, factual mistakes. For example, in Acts chapter 7, it says that 75 people went down to Egypt in the time of Jacob. In the Torah, it says four different times that it was 70 people, not 75. Or who gave the Torah? So in the Christian Bible, in the book of Hebrews and the book of Acts, it says the Torah was given by angels. Whereas in the Torah itself, in the book of Exodus, in the book of Deuteronomy, it says very clearly the Torah was given directly by the Almighty, by God himself, the creator, not by angels. And then we see countless times where the Christian Bible distorts and mistranslates the Hebrew scriptures. So for example, in a very famous passage in Romans chapter 11, verses 26 and 27, Paul writes that out of Zion, out of Zion, coming out of Zion, there'll be a redeemer and he's going to come to remove sin from Jacob, from Israel. But Isaiah, the original source of this in chapter 59, verses 20 to 21, Isaiah says that the Redeemer is not going to come out of Zion. He's going to come to Zion and he's not going to come to remove sins from Jacob. He's going to come to those in Jacob who have on their own already turned from sin. So here you see Paul in Romans basically distorting what Isaiah says in a very, very significant place, by the way, because this distortion of Isaiah is really used to redefine the whole concept of the Messiah. And one of the most famous examples is in Matthew chapter one, verses 22 to 23, Matthew says that the Messiah would be born to a virgin. And that's simply a mistranslation of the Hebrew um, from Isaiah chapter seven, verse 14, which speaks about not a betula. Betula is the Hebrew word for a virgin. Isaiah speaks about a Alma, a young woman. She may or may not be a virgin. She's simply a young woman. And so there are countless examples of where the Christian Bible simply distorts, mistranslates uh, the text of the Hebrew Bible. And for those basic reasons, um, no one who takes the Tanakh seriously can accept the Christian Bible as scripture. So that's basically what I wanted to share uh, tonight. And um, all right, all right, very cool. I hope that was I hope that was clear. That was clear and, and enlightening. That, yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Okay. All right. Thank very God. Good. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. It was great. A lot of activity going on and uh, sparking a lot of conversations there. Good, good viewer count. I can't tonight. see it. I can't see it. That's okay. That's okay. You had a great viewer count. There's about seventy-five uh, currently. 
logged into the YouTube live stream, which is really good. So, all right. Well, Rabbi, great job as usual. And uh, Hashem willing, we'll see you same time, same place next week as we move forward. Looking forward. Awesome. Awesome. Take care, everybody. Shalom, shalom. Okay, shalom, shalom. <laughs>